Hi, my name's Tibbs. I'm going to try not to move away from the microphones and just track you because then that will go wrong. Um, so, I'm currently a developer educator at Ivan um, since the beginning of the year. Before that, I've been a programmer for many years and the last decade or so has been doing stuff with cloud technologies as a back-end developer. And so I was wanting to desperately to learn more about Kafka and I moved to this job and part of my job nowadays is to learn technologies and explain them to people. So you get to be my guinea pigs. So I'm going to look a bit about why I'm interested in messaging and why that leads me to Apache Kafka. And then I'm going to talk about simulating a fish and chip shop as a very simple example of this. So I'll go over how to talk to Kafka. We'll start with a simple model and work our way up. And there's a demo you can play with afterwards. And there's some ideas for things you can do to extend the demos. Now, because I work for Ivan and we're in the business of offering a fully managed open source cloud data platform, um, the demos as presented all use Ivan technology. Um, hey, I would, wouldn't I? Um, I'm not going to do demos live today because Wi Fi, instead, you get some recordings. The website you saw at the beginning, which I'll give again at the end, has the source code for you if you want to play later. So, I've dealt with messaging on and off over the years um, in several contexts. Three of the most interesting ones are components on a, between components on a set top box, your video controller, your browser, etc. Configuration between microservices and Internet of Things messaging. You've got thousands of little Internet of Things devices wanting to talk home to say, hey, my temperature is such and such, or I'm at such and such a position. And going the other way, the support systems want to say, you know you should update your firmware to this new piece of code. Um, do that now. And there you're often talking to groups of devices. So if you're looking at components on a set-top box, you want something, you're a relatively constrained computer, you want something lightweight and fast, you're probably going to use something like zero MQ or a related technology like that, very mature technology. If you're managing configuration between microservices, please use a state machine. And then you probably want, again, something relatively simple to allow the microservices to tell each other what state they're in. And again, zero MQ, any, any queuing system you like is probably going to do well. Internet of Things, though, begins to bring in scaling. And here you want something that's robust and can handle large numbers of producers, large numbers of consumers with various reliability constraints. And here is where Kafka can be a very good fit. Less so for the others, but it is the master of scale. So what I'm wanting from messaging in this sort of situation I clearly want multiple producers and multiple consumers. You might think of the IoT devices at either end, and you might think of the, the back-end services that are supporting them at either end. I want to know single delivery. If I send a message, I want it to arrive once. And I want it to be guaranteed that it will deliver, at least to a good um, um, reliability. I want to know that if some component of the system crashes, it will all start up again and carry on from where it left off. And I don't want back pressure handling. Uh, classic problem you will have with queuing systems like RabbitMQ is this is the queue fills up. And then you have to wait until the consumer has eaten something out of the queue, so there's room to put more things onto it. That's a pain. I don't want to do that. This is where Apache Kafka comes in. I do not know where that logo comes from, it's very strange, but hey. Um, and it covers all the cases I want. I'm going to go to my queue cards again, these are my security queue cards the two things that can I remember. Kafka is an open source event streaming platform. And it was originally developed at LinkedIn. Um, in the GitHub notes, there's a, there's a link to the paper about it, which is, I think, required reading in this field for why event streaming is a big, important concept. So Kafka has events for its messages. These are things that happen, and it's a streaming event manager. Producers send messages, and consumers read them. We can have multiple producers and multiple consumers independently. A producer sends a message to a named topic, and each consumer chooses to read from a, particular, from a topic, just one topic for each consumer. And then internally to topics, we can have partitions to help spread the load. So we look at a very simple case. A producer is sending events to a topic, the cloudy thing there, and a consumer is reading from it. 
So if we consider we've got events 1, 2, 3, 4 coming out of our producer, the topic will store events 1, 2, 3, 4, and the consumer will consume events 1, 2, 3, 4 in that order, as you might expect. If we've got multiple producers, I've just spotted a typo, of course I have, and multiple consumers, then we've got 1, 2, 3 coming in from one producer, BCD coming in from another producer. They occur in some order in the topic, and the consumers will get them in that order. We can group consumers together. So this is the same producers we had before. We've got two partitions here. So producer, the top producer is sending the top partition, the bottom producer to the bottom partition. The consumer at the bottom right is acting as we saw before. They're getting the, the messages in some order. Um, they're relatively ordered correctly for producers, but no ordering between producers. The consumers at the top share the same consumer group, and that means they share reading. So they won't get They'll each only get messages from one or more partitions. They won't, they won't get the, the messages will not end up in multiple consumers. If there's more partitions than there are consumers, then it may end up that one consumer is reading from more than one partition, but that will be predictable. So let's look at our fish and chip shop. So we're going to start with just cod and chips, the, the great British tradition, which are always ready to be served. We're not going to be worrying about cooking for a moment. And it was pointed out by a colleague that this is going to be watched by people who don't necessarily have the British tradition of fish and chip shops, and so I should explain some terms. They, in particular, hadn't heard of place, so they had to look it up. So cod is the traditional white fish for English fish and chip shops. You don't always get cod these days, uh, but it's still considered the default. Chips, if you're not familiar with British chips, are kind of like soggier French fries. Um, place is a flat fish. I like place. It's a bit sweeter than cod. And until I tend to use that term where I maybe should say cash register. So you go into a traditional fish and chip shop, there'll be a counter with a till, one or more tills on it, and so you'll pay your money and make your order. Behind that, there'll be a big cabinet um, with glass containers on the top in which you can see ready made fish and maybe meat pies and sausages in batter or whatever ready to be served. And below that, there will be vats of, uh, baskets of chips ready to be served. And behind that, there will be a cook who will be making up the things to go in the hot cabinet, who will be frying things. So let's look at serving a customer. The customer comes in, goes to the till, makes the order, pays the money. The till sends an event to the order topic, and then the preparer consumes the order from the order topic, makes up the fish and chips, and passes them to the customer. I'm going to leave the customers out in most of the diagrams from now on because actually we don't care about them. Um, they're not actually part of our model. So an order might be this piece of JSON. We've got an order number, which we're using for bookkeeping purposes. Uh, and then we've got the parts of the order. So I've got cotton chips, and I've got a large portion of chips. I'm modeling that as two portions of chips. I don't know if a large portion of chips is twice the size of a small portion, but it's, it's useful for convenience. So we get to do my first demo. This is where I have to do the classic playing with screens, if I can remember where my buttons are. So it's a pre-prepared video. We start with demo one. So here we've got a little application that's showing you on the left, we've got a producer, orders are coming in, and on the right, we've got the food preparer. And you can see the order comes in, and then it changes to ready as the food preparer has made it up and presumably passed it on to the customer. Nothing very surprising. It's all very predictable and nice and easy. Quit that and the gooey magic to go back to the preview. So the technology I'm using to do this. So Kafka Python is the natural library to reach out to, to talk to Kafka using Python. It has much the same API as the standard Java um, APIs for talking to Kafka. Kafka is a Java application at heart. Uh, it's widely regarded as the place to go if you just want to talk to, to Kafka. It has just about every, most of the things you need. For reasons I'll get into a little bit later, I'm also using AIO Kafka, which is an asynchronous library for talking to Kafka. It doesn't have quite as much capability as Kafka Python, uh, but where it lacks something, you can, probably, you can use the two together. So, for instance, if you want to configure your topics, you'd use Kafka Python to do it. There's nothing to stop you using both in the same program. The little terminal UI you saw there is from a package called Textual, which is based on top of Rich. I've got a colleague who's turned me on to the Click and Rich libraries, Click for CLI handling, Rich for doing um, 
presenting data. They're very beautiful. So in our code for Kafka Python, the synchronous code, we import a Kafka producer, we tell it the host and port for the service, we would traditionally use an SSL security, for instance, to pass in our certificate files. We need to say how to serialize our values because Kafka is byte-oriented. So we need to turn our JSON into bytes. And then we just loop while the shop is open, send something to the order topic in this case. We name so the producer names which topic it wants to write to. Consuming is very similar. We import the Kafka consumer. We say what topic we want, the here order again, and then we specify the host and SSL port and the SSL certificates again. This time we have to have a deserializer to turn the bytes back into JSON. And then we loop over the consumer. I love Python sometimes, getting the messages and printing them out. For the asynchronous code, we have to create an SSL context, which is a, a more modern way of doing it in Python. Uh, there's a helper for that. So we bundle that up rather than having to pass them in as arguments. You can do that with Kafka Python, but it's not the way the examples normally show it, probably because they're a bit older. So unsurprisingly, the AIO Kafka producer looks very like a synchronous case, except that we're passing in the SSL context instead of having to specify multiple arguments. We await our producer to start in the standard way you do with asynchronous things, and then while the shop is open, we await the producer.send, just as before. And the asynchronous consumer, we specify the topic we want to consume, we await the consumer to start, and then we do an async for to consume things off the consumer. Now, hopefully our fish and ship shop is successful, we get more customers, and one till isn't enough. So let's add some more tills. So if we add three tills, now it's worth having partitions. So I've got three partitions, and one for each till in fact. Still got one food preparer, let's hope they can move fast. So we're now expanding the order we want to keep for auditing purposes which till they came in. So the till puts its till number into the order, otherwise the order is the same as before. To alter the code, when we create our topic, we now say number of partitions is three. Uh, the demo two orders, for each demo, I name the topic by the demo so I don't get messages in the same queue because otherwise it gets very confusing. Replication back is a standard argument, I'm, I'm not going to explain that. And then we need to create three tilt producers instead of one. So this is our second demo. By the magic of losing my cursor, there it is. Demo two. So along the top, we've got three producers. You can see the orders coming in. And at the bottom, we've got one poor, lonely consumer. And as this goes on, you can see we're already up to our orders 19, 20, 22. Oh dear, the consumer's not keeping up. So perhaps this was a bit unfair. They're running around like mad. But we can still see it's going on. So if we quit that and go back to the slides. I have a bad habit of losing my cursor. So let's add another food preparer. So to alter the code, we create two consumers instead of one, and we make sure they're both in the consumer group, same consumer group. If you remember earlier, we said if consumers share the same consumer group, then the messages will be shared out between them. Um, if I run the demo more than once, there's a possibility that there will still be, particularly from demo two, where there were messages left that the consumer hadn't used, there's a possibility there might be things left in the queue from a previous demo. I don't want to pick those up. The simplest solution there is to say, when I start the consumer, I say, seek to the end of the queue. So the next thing you get will be the next message that's put on the queue. I'll ignore all the older ones. You can also seek to the start, say, find me the oldest message you've got. Or you can store an offset and seek to it later. This can be useful for uh, disaster recovery cases where you um, want to audit where you pick up or something like that. There's, there's examples of all those in the documentation for the library. To send to different partitions, I've got three ways I can do it. I can just do my send as before, and that should choose a, a relatively naive way of choosing which partition to write to. I think the default is meant to be round robin, and the documentation for Kafka, Kafka Python says that's not very good, don't use it. Um, I can specify a key, I'm specifying a till here, which is one of the values in the order, and it will look up that and hash it 
and use the hash to decide which partition to go to. Or I can explicitly specify a partition. Here I'm using till number minus one. My tills are one, two, three. I've got partitions not one, two. Now, for reasons I don't understand, in the next demo, only the third one worked. If I used the other two, I ended up just populating one partition. Um, I was talking to my boss, who's a Kafka expert, and he was saying, sticky partitions, look up sticky partitions. So this is my homework for after the conference to figure out what's going on there. Regardless, it's not a bad way of doing it in a very simple system where I've got three partitions and three tills. Target the partitions explicitly. So we now go to demo of this. So again, we've got the three producers along the top, just as before. Now, in this case, I discovered well, the other thing I don't quite understand. I have to wait for the consumers to be ready before I start producing, or, um, or the producers start too early. I don't know why this demo is different than the others. So here we can see we're still up to going around, we're up to 27, 30, etc. And this time, two food preparers is sufficient. They manage to keep up. We don't need a th third food preparer. I don't advise simulating your fish and chip shop to work out how many employees you need using my software. I think that would be bad. Apologies while I move the mouse. So I said we were using Ivan Technologies. If I go to the Ivan web console for my lovingly, my service lovingly called Tibbs Kafka Fish, I can do various things. In particular, it gives me the connection information there in a very easy way to use. Um, you can see the three dots there where it says nodes at the top. That means that my Kafka service has three nodes, which is about the minimum you'd want. Um, I can look at the topics. I've got demo one, demo two, and demo three topics. And you can see how many partitions each has. So demo one only has one, the others have three. I can get a bar chart showing how much stuff there is in each partition for demo three. Um, here it is again showing these three. I've got the same group, consumer group for all of them. And there's various metrics I can look up without having to start using Grafana or anything that are already on the service. Here's this CPU usage. I'm not sure how much use that is, but it's showing me the three, the, uh, the three nodes of the Kafka service. This, that was my advert for Ivan. So, however, I like place. I'm the sort of awkward person that goes into a fish and chip shop and orders something that needs to be cooked ready for me. So we need someone to cook it. So let's see if we, see if we can simulate that. So let's go back to our one till, one food preparer, just for simplicity. So if the food preparer gets an order that asks for place, they go, oh, I need to ask the cook to make that. So they send the order on to the cook topic. The cook consumes an event from the cook topic and says, I need to cook some place. So they cook the place, and then they send the order back to the order topic. And the preparer will pick it up again and say, oh, now the place is ready. So we need to simulate that. So here's an order with place. You can see I've got cotton chips, a large chips, and I've got placing chips. And we add a ready boolean to model the has it been cooked yet. It's a very clumsy model, but it gets us where we want. So in the food preparer, I've got a magic method that says, is all of the order available? And what that does, it looks in the order, and if the order that's come from the till doesn't have ready in it, doesn't have a ready value in it, it says, well, was there place in the order? If there was place in the order, then I'll set ready to false. If there wasn't place in the order, hey, I know you can do it immediately, I'll set ready to true, and then I'll return the order. If there was already a ready in it, it's come from the cook, I don't need to do anything. And then you cook, so the producer calls that method, and if the order is not available, it sends it on to the, it sends it on to the cook topic to be cooked. This, if, that's too, if that's too fast to follow, don't worry, you can always read the code later. And the cook, which is a new consumer, um, receives messages from its AI or Kafka instance. Um, it waits a moment to pretend to be cooking something. Um, and then it marks the order as ready. This is the important bit, because otherwise that order will loop around and around and around forever. I, I, it's not that I ever found this out the hard way. Um, and then it sends it back to the original order thing for the producer to pick up. We have a very simple demo showing that. So we've got one producer at the top left, one consume, one preparer at the top right. The tick in the order ready things means that the order was ready. That means the ready was true. 
And then at the bottom, when we eventually get a place order, it pops down to the cook, who cooks it, marks it as available, sends it back, and then you'll see it picked up by the preparer. You can play all of these later if you want. Um, so we've looked at modeling, ordering and serving cotton chips. We've looked at multiple producers and consumers, and we've done place very simply. So I'm going to stick to some homework, because the demo code is out there on the GitHub repository. You can play with it. What if I want to add someone who wants to analyze what's going on in the shop? So they're going to take the orders, shove them in a database, so they can do, I don't know, how, many, how, many, how much money have we made today? How many fish do we need to order for tomorrow? So we could do that the same way as we've done the food preparer. We could just consume messages from our order. But there's another way to do it. We can use a thing called Kafka Connect, another Apache project. And that lets us create a service in the cloud that listens to the same topic and copies all, does things, takes all the messages and shoves them into something else, in this case a database. And it does it at the same sort of scalability as Kafka. We've got documentation on our website of how to use it. So we'd, if I was doing it, I'd create a PostgreSQL database with a relevant table. I'd set up Kafka Connect on my service. And then um, I'd create a JDBC, a Java database connector, sync connector. So Kafka Connect comes with a whole host, a whole family of different connectors for um, sending things to things uh, without you having to code anything. And then in my Python demo, I grab stuff out of the database uh, and, and display something like a count of how many orders they've been or something. Homework 2. Modeling the cook was atrocious there. We really should use something like a Redis cache to simulate what's in the hot cabinet. So we'd have entries for how many portions of cod, chips, and place are available, all starting with naught. So the preparer would compare the order it's just received to what's in the hot cabinet in the cache. If there's enough, decrement the cache. All done. If there's not, send the order to the cook. For, cook, for, for place, the cook would just add however many places are asked for to the hot cabinet, to the cache. For cotton chips, round it up a bit if necessary, and send the order back to the order topic as before, at which point the preparer says, oh, now I can take stuff out of the, the cache. This actually is a lovely use case for Redis. So we've done all of the things we've done before. We've looked at Kafka connectors, which I encourage you to go and look up later. And we've talked briefly about how we can shove Redis into this demo for extra goodness. I like Redis a lot. I should acknowledge that all of the services I've talked about that aren't to do with Ivan don't belong to Ivan. They belong to the owners of their registered trademarks. Um, this is important to say. You can get a free trial of Ivan at this link, um, which means you can play yourselves at home later. And we're hiring. We have positions all across the company, and I'd like to be hiring for the foreseeable future. As always with me these days, the slides were written in restructured text and converted to PDF using the wonderful RST to PDF. And everything is in the GitHub repository. The QR link will take you there as well. The source code for the demos is there. The videos are in a different repository to save you having to download videos. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to come talk to me later if you'd like me to risk the Wi-Fi and show you this live, or if you just want to go over the code or something like that and, and talk about it. I'm still learning about Kafka, so don't necessarily expect all the answers. Thank you.